now it's still sensitive to critics. Uh, and along with a confidence in my judgment, I guess I've gotten a humility about what's really been accomplished. So you can see that I believe that a sense of humor and a somewhat irreverent attitude helps you to cope with it all. But most encouraging have been some letters and expressions of praise that I got and thanks. And I've gotten a lot of recognition and credit cast upon me, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, persons take the time to write complimentary letters too, but some get carried away. For example, pre-medical student in Antwerp, Belgium concludes, for all these things, please continue in that way to bring us all a better world. <laughs> From Madras, India, an engineering undergraduate writes, as a student, I was thrilled to go through all your books. What a lovely experience it was. Really, I was enthused to such an extent that I changed my major to physics. Gee, I thought you could get more enthusiasm than that, but okay. <laughs> From Pakistan, I am an ardent lover of your books. Tell me where I can find any other articles, reports, projects, etc., that you have written. From Sun Sweet Ushpinu in India, thanks for all your good works as I pray the Lord to extend your days on earth to enable you to impart your knowledge to those that are in want. Good luck in all your undertakings. You are the hero of my life. <laughs> then in 1986, I get a letter from Gary Noe at South Bend, Indiana. Thank you for having co-authored the text that saved me from going into banking and making ungodly sums of money. <laughs> So you see, you got to ride with it. Well, encouraged by all that extravagant praise, the thought occurred to me that one way to promote physics might be to make a movie out of the textbook. After all, at the time, Woody Allen had just made a movie out of a book. I think it was called All the Things You Want to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. And I'm not sure the movie had any connection to the book, but nevertheless, there was such a movie. You remember that? This was when Alan was in favor. You've got to go back with me, okay? So my wife said it was a good idea to ask him to make a movie out of a textbook, but that he probably would prefer a psychology textbook to a physics textbook. Uh, so I countered with the facts that our text was often in heat, it had magnetic moments, there was friction, attraction and repulsion, light at the end of the tunnel, it was electrifying and radiant, and Woody Allen could probably call it fizz sex. Moreover, most movie scripts don't follow the book at all. So there's room for imagination. And another asset of our book, it was already in two parts, Godfather One, Godfather Two. We had part one, we had part two. We were all set. But what really stalled me was when a colleague said, Bob, who has the movie rights to your book? So I looked through the contract, and you know, there's no comment there about movie rights. So I called up, got on the phone, and I called my editor. When he heard my question, he laughed. He said, you're not serious. I said, you're damn right I'm serious. So I hear him calling all his colleagues in the background, and they're all bursting out laughing. <laughs> Who would think of that but Bob Resnick, you know? And so <laughs> I said, get Wiley's lawyer to call me. So a few days later, I get a letter from the lawyer, and I was very impressed. His address was number one Wall Street. So this issue had reached the very height of capitalism, right at the top. Now, number one Wall Street is a 70-story building, I must tell you, with God knows how many offices. But that's where he was. And he told me that when he was going to call me, and I should have the contract in front of me, and he would discuss it with me. And so I got his call. He said, Bob, turn to page so-and-so. I did. Look at line so-and-so. I did. See the word et cetera? I said, yes. He said, that's it. We've got the movie rights. <laughs> so somehow that took all the joy uh, out of my dream, and I never mailed a damn letter off to Woody Allen. What a shame. Well, okay, maybe I should mention some frustrations along the way. Thank you for giving me the time here. I've already mentioned that the book was translated into Russian and Chinese. It's now, as far as we can tell, it's in about 40 languages. We're not sure. Um, 
But I was especially pleased when the Greek edition appeared because, uh, hell, our book was Greek to everybody anyhow to begin with. And to most students, you know, that's what it was. But what intrigued me is what would the Greek translator do when he came to Appendix H, which was the Greek alphabet, with lowercase and uppercase letters and how to pronounce it and everything else. I immediately went to the index, I mean to the appendices, hoping there'd be the English language there. Instead, they skipped the whole uh, appendix. And I, you know, I don't think I've ever looked at the book since. I was so disappointed. No sense of humor. Well, another frustration is that uh, I guess this was a new edition, and I had desk copies of the book, and it looked kind of thin to me. And I said, gee, they must be using thinner paper. Uh, and somehow, you know, I saw the appendices and the index, but when I went to the text, I saw that it ended not only in the middle of a chapter, in the middle of a paragraph, in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a word. The book ended right there. And I went back, and I saw that 100 pages were missing. And so I checked with my colleagues and their desk copies, and 100 pages were missing. So I called the editor, and I said, you know, you must have had a bad run. Uh, all the books here have 100 pages missing. He says, I'll check. So everybody in the office had 100 pages missing. Well, you see where I'm going. All 30,000 copies that had been mailed out to universities, and they were already teaching them, had 100 pages missing. But nobody had got there yet <laughs> to, to look at it and to find that 100 pages were missing, you see. And Wiley simply had to replace 30,000 copies of the book. And it turned out that there was some fault of some copy editor at the printers who read uh, 1,012 pages instead of 1,112 and just inanely just cut it off at that point. And that's how it came out. So I wrote a limerick, a text by two learned sages, provided them well with wages. But the third edition is in poor condition. It's missing its last hundred pages. Well, 